And now, right to your host of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Down the Garden Path, where we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice while doing our best to help you seasonally manage your garden and landscape. I'm Joanne Shaw, owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design, and with me is my co-host and co-author, Matthew Dressing. Good evening, Joanne. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Matthew Dressing, owner of Natural Affinity Garden Design. As landscape designers, gardeners, and authors, we believe it's important and possible to have great gardens, which are sustainable and low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. That's right. So with summer well underway and many of us heading off to the cottage or to spend some time out in nature, we wanted to shine some light on identifying some of the harmful plants you might find during your travels as well as we've had some listeners requesting this show and this topic. So thank you for requesting it. It's been, it's a great idea. So we're excited to do it. Um, So if you have a story about a run-in with a harmful plant or a close call, uh, we'd love to hear about it. So send it to us here at down the garden path podcast at hotmail.com. That is right. And now before we jump into this show titled poisonous plants, we want to throw out a little disclaimer. We are going to talk about some harmful plants that I'm sure you've all heard about or haven't heard a story about or run into yourself. Uh, But we just want to say as a quick note off the top, uh, as we talk about them, identifying them, a little bit about them, where you can find them, what they like or don't like, we might end up mentioning or having some listeners share some treatment methods with them. So Please be advised, any treatment mentioned during this show is not medical advice and is based on the personal experience of Joanne, Matthew, and their listeners of the podcast. If you encounter any of the plants mentioned during the show, please seek professional medical attention immediately. As always, in case of an emergency, please call 911. And with that, yes. And on that light note, no, just kidding. <laughs> you know, that's that's better than my lawyer's writing. I, I seriously, I told you, Gary, that I read his. I'm like, yeah, this is really a, a good one. So you cover all the bases. That's... So have either of you run into like poison ivy, poison oak? Uh, well, I have in the past as a kid and a scout and all that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it was basically calamine lotion. <laughs> you remember that the pink stuff? Yeah, the pink and, stuff. And uh, and basically, uh, one time I I, do- I got some poison oak, and that wasn't working. As Matthew said, I went to see my doctor back in the day, and he actually gave me a topical antibiotic that would kill some of the stinging and itching. But uh, that's the perfect advice to see, you know, professional medical help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. How about how about you, Matt? Yeah, like Gary said, um, right, Boy Scouts growing up, lots of camping, um, even landscaping. When I started landscaping, uh, we had this one space that was like our dump space. It was kind of a farmer's field and they would let us dump our lawn clippings and stuff. But uh, there was uh, stinging nettle uh, everywhere. So we had to be careful as we emptied the trucks and and dump stuff off because it was really low. Uh, and really high, so it could just get you at any point. And uh, I've been hit once or twice with that. So, and then like Gary said, right, that calamine lotion, you can still buy that in the little bottle and the pink yes. stuff. Or, I don't think know, they've changed the bottle, right? No, we were kids. No. I think it's still no. that same bottle. Yep. <laughs> it, yeah. Weird brown bottle with the white cap. <laughs> white cap. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, um, I well, it was funny because I don't. I just recently was. I was saying before the show about stinging nettle that obviously it just appeared in my pots in the backyard, like. It looks so innocuous, like a little tiny weed in a, in a tomato, like a plant where I'm growing the tomatoes. And I happened to grab it without, without gloves on. I was like, oh my goodness gracious. Um, But I've never had poison ivy or any of those other ones that can be quite serious. So, Um, but I've been with clients that I've been with clients who've said, you know, oh, be careful in here. Uh, I had one last year where we weren't, where we were trying to like 
um, take over some area that had previously been naturalized in her yard. Oh. And um, the first day I visited, uh, I was there like barefoot and sandals. And she's like, and I was like, is there, I said, can I go back there to measure or is there like poison ivy? And she goes, yes, there actually is. And I said, okay, well then I have to come back to measure. So mm -hmm. I knew to come back, like wear boots and, and, you know, that kind of thing. Cause she had just, um, got, gotten a really bad, uh, bad. And she was actually a doctor when she'd gotten a really oh. bad, uh, bad case of uh, poison ivy. So, uh, so yeah, so it, it can be, uh, it can be, um, some people I think are more susceptible. I've heard that. I don't know if it's true, um, more susceptible to it than others, sensitive to it. That's probably easier word to say. That is yeah. true. That is true. As a paramedic, I had to study a little bit about this stuff, but not, not a lot. But some people, yeah, have more of a severe reaction than others. Yeah, and I've even heard of people being um, immune to it completely. Um, and then some people just like a super sensitive reaction um, but I've also just in some of the reading for the show, uh, you know, just that can go either way. So you, you know, some people tried to like make themselves immune to it by exposing it to themselves. Mm -hmm. Or if you've been, yeah, I don't know why you would do that. Uh, or if you've been immune all your life, you just think, you know, I'm immune, whatever, I'll go in and get it. But as you change and your biochemistry changes, suddenly you're sensitive to it or, mm. or whatever. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And you know, what's funny is like, I can ID many, many different things, but for some reason, despite seeing the picture of poison ivy many times, you know, the leaves of three and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't know. It just does not stand out to me. And we've even been on like garden tours where they've said, you know, stay on the path, you know, on the edges of the path, there's poison ivy. And uh, we did this last year in Niagara on the lake. And I can remember like, actually like looking for it to see, okay, well, I even like, now that I know it's there, can I spot it? Well, nah, I don't know what it is about it, but uh, I can't really, it doesn't stay with me as, as much as like the perennials and shrubs and trees and stuff. So. Yeah, for sure. And there are a lot of little guys uh, that are out there like um, ashes, uh, ash trees that when they're young and they're small, they can be in and amongst the poison ivies or the poison oaks <clears throat> and look very similar. Um, so there are a lot of little seedlings that will come up and kind of disguise themselves mm. uh, in amongst it too. But it's definitely that leaves of three and there's a few other uh, little tips as well. But before we jump into maybe, uh, you know, poison ivy I think is the big bad, the biggest of all the baddies. Um, a couple of quick um, emails before we jump in. Bob has written in, Joanne and Matt love the show, love the book, love you, and thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. Uh, don't forget, uh, we hope you've left us a loving review as well. We would really appreciate that. Lisa's also written in, uh, hi, Joanne and Matt. Uh, love your intro for Matt, co and co-author, so very cool. Uh, plants that are poisonous. And then Lisa has given us a little bit of text just regarding stinging nettle. So just to kind of build on uh, stinging nettle, uh, the little hairs on the stems of these plants can inject your skin with a combination of chemicals. One of them is formic acid and helps put the sting uh, in the bee sting and fire ant bites. It's part of what causes the itchy and even painful allergic skin reaction. Stems grow unbranched in pathways to about four feet tall. Uh, but sometimes high as six. So look for those stinging hairs on the stem, which are a telltale mm -hmm. sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's, those are the sizes that I found in that little patch. And once you look at it, you get that very serrated toothed edge of that uh, ovate kind of leaf and those little fine hairs mm -hmm. uh, that you look at that really bite into you for sure. So yeah, yeah Joanne, you were stating you were pulling them out and you felt like there was something in you like little slivers and yeah yeah and mine were tiny and I didn't expect them to be in a container like on my like I have no like you know a little vegetable garden and a patio with a pool like there's not no wildlife you know what I mean no, no you know what I mean nature but obviously something's blown in because then um, I've got the, I do have a Japanese maple in the corner with um, some river rock underneath it. And I spotted, I, I said to my son, I said, pull that. I think it was a bigger like, plant of poison, of, of stinging nettle. And I said, you know what, get your gloves on when you go to take that out. I think that's stinging nettle. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, I was just not prepared for it to be in my yard. Yeah, for sure. Especially, yeah, it's such an urban area, mm -hmm. right? For 
So thank you very much, Lisa, for mm -hmm. uh, sending in that little bit uh, on stinging nettle, uh, for sure. Thank you so much. So yeah, if you guys have any experiences or questions or um, information you want to share, don't forget to hit down the garden path podcast at hotmail.com. We'll receive all of our email at any time. We love to hear from our guests. I think another part of our disclaimer is um, and I think we've kind of touched it, but maybe we would just say it right out. You know, just if you are working for these or working with these plants, if you have to go into an area, you know, they might be or you do see them, make sure that you're always wearing your protective equipment. You know, you know, long pants, pull up your socks, have boots, uh, wear gloves. And if you're in a very woody area, it may seem like overkill, but if you're not wearing glasses or even if you are, you know, use, um, you know, wear some eye protection. You never know when you're bending down or you try to pull something uh, and it resists and it kind of whips at you in the face or your hand jerks towards you. You never know when you're going to get that. So always wear your proper uh, PPE. And don't forget to thoroughly wash your hands and clothing and tools with soap and hot water multiple times, uh, especially your tools, because you're going to be touching them with bare hands regularly mm -hmm. uh, before you use them again. So as we were talking about poison ivy, um, you or sheol, or you, or I do, I'm not sure the pronunciation, but it's the, the oil, that active ingredient in poison ivy, um, it very easily transfers from surface to surface. Mm. And they have found, uh, I read one story uh, a while ago about a lawnmower that was an old, old timey time lawnmower kind of thing. It was in a museum. It was an older um, vintage piece, but it, it had been used at one point in its last days to mow through some poison ivy. And they had one of the museum curators who were, or some personnel who were moving it around, suddenly get a rash from moving around this inert lawnmower. And they swabbed the deck to see what was underneath. And they found the poison ivy uh, thing. And it had last been used over 50 years ago. So oh my this, gosh. Yes, this Eurushriol, or I'm going to say it so bad. So sorry, if anybody wants to correct me, I'd love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, is very long lasting and very easily transfers over time and can transfer over time. That does seem like a mouthful. I'm trying to see how it's written. You rush you also. It's U R U S H I. Oh, I see. Yeah, you rush you all. Yeah, you rush you all. <laughs> you rush you all. Um, so much crazy. So yeah. So the other and oh, I thought that was interesting. It says even if you're burning it. That was my next point. Uh, is that your Number next point? One. So sometimes, yeah, because I think people who discover they have it on their property or maybe near a campsite or at the cottage. They think that that might be a good way to get rid of it. Well, it's not. <laughs> no, all of those oils will aerosolize and you will bring, breathe them in. You can irritate and damage your lungs and cause fluid uh, to accumulate in your lungs. Uh, especially if you're getting really good wafts of that smoke, you can be in serious trouble. Maybe not, maybe not right away, uh, but shortly after as that oil sets in and the, the fluid gathers, you could be in the hospital in a couple of days for sure. Wow, so, that's interesting. It is. Um, yeah, and this this thing I'm reading says uh, the skin of mangoes also contain erythritol <laughs> and oh. can produce symptoms similar to poison ivy dermatitis. That's interesting. See, now I'm going to go buy a mango and try that. <laughs> <laughs> Rub it on my arm. Calamine oh, lotion at the yes. rest. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, so yeah. So did you, um, so yes, definitely. I think with ticks these days too, I think people are getting better at like protecting themselves. Like it's another reason to make sure you've got long pants and, and socks and things like that, which is fine when we've had like kind of cooler ish weather, like we've had, but when it's really hot, that's gotta be really hard. Yeah, that is, it gets very hard and very mm -hmm. sweaty for sure. Um, I know I get very warm wearing my pants when I'm doing some landscaping, but, um, you know what, better, better safe than sorry. And, you know, just, there's a lot of alerts that are out there where in your area where we are and aren't finding ticks. Um, one of our poisonous plants was just, uh, had an alert out recently, a few weeks ago, um, out at, uh, the Evergreen Brickworks 
in Toronto, found uh, in their wild or more native spaces in the Don Valley there, uh, they found giant hogweed. Okay. And so, yeah, so another huge, crazy, wild one that's going to start to hurt people. Yeah, and that one's tricky because it kind of it has a flower very similar to Queen Anne's lace, although it yes. is much bigger. Yes. Um, so I think most people know, and it's like part of the carrot, like the Queen Anne's lace is in the carrot family too, isn't it? Like yeah. the you know seed heads for carrots and the seed heads for Queen Anne's lace look very similar, and then giant hogweed is like on steroids, um, that type of thing. So that's something to definitely keep. So you know, really in that case, I think it's almost like because it stands out you know poison ivy kind of blends in and you miss it but i feel like giant hogweed stands out as something cool that might kind of cause you to go check it out and and what is this and kind of examine it and stuff so no don't do that (laughs) because the leaves are quite large and it's the it stands almost at five feet tall doesn't it yes i've seen them five to eight feet tall yeah okay yeah. And when you get that sap on it, um, it yeah, like you were saying, it looks like a cow parsnip in the wild carrot and everything. When you get that um, oil on you, it actually will absorb into the skin and then it reacts with the sunlight and will continue to burn the skin and can make great big blisters by like two by two inches, uh, thick and yellowy and pussy and absolutely brutal. So if you see something like that, those big, multi-branched, humble, flat-headed mm-hmm. white flowers uh, that look like a Queen Anne's lace or a wild parsnip or cow parsnip, uh, that kind of stuff, wild carrot, just avoid it to be safe, especially mm-hmm. when it's fairly tall for you as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is exceptionally toxic. Um, so I know with poison ivy, the only way to really remove it, if you have it in your property, I know we're talking about how it affects us as, as well, but if you are trying to remove it, um, it's your only option really is Roundup, right? Like digging it out isn't an option, obviously handling it, pulling it out with gloves, even with gloves on and stuff isn't an option. Um, really it's a, it's a Roundup works on it though, right? Yeah. Roundup from what I have seen still works on the poison ivy and the oaks and the sumac. And that is why we still, um, we still have access to the Roundup. I know in the U S there are different uh, homeowner chemicals, landscape, residential kind of restrictions for what chemicals and herbicides and Mm -hmm. pesticides you have in Canada. It's pretty strict, but that one was one of the big ones that were left behind uh, for that reason. So that Mm -hmm. we could, treat those plants that we do not have. However, now saying that, and perhaps somebody else has again heard something that I have not, but uh, in a recent article in, I think it was April, I want to say it was Landscape Ontario, but it might have been uh, another landscape association, Roundup by about 2023, 2024, will be taken off the market for residential use in the United States and Canada. They're going to phase it completely out. Okay. They will still make it for farmers and those who are registered, et cetera. But so we're not sure what's happening yeah. there. But it, from the articles, I remember it was just a, you know, all the legal stuff that had happened over the past few years. They're pulling. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to wait and see. But that's the latest yeah. word that I'd heard about the glyphosate. Yeah, for sure. And we know things start to adapt, like um, um, like dog strangling vine isn't you know roundup doesn't work it's resistant to round out you know so i feel like it's just a you know eventually nature kind of figures out or you know something happens right it doesn't really quite work so um so don has written in and he said here's one for us um uh wild parsnip these are coarse sawtooth leaves that grow on hairy grew stems that are two to five feet tall they have yellow flowers sorry joanne that's very <laughs> funny very funny dawn and grow an umbrella pattern like other plants in the carrot family okay that same kind of thing when the juice from crushed leaves stalks or flowers touch your sin skin sunlight can cause a skin rash within a day or two so very interesting so that could even be what um gary you were mentioning one of the other uh, show hosts yeah who might be listening tonight she's not she you know end up with a bit of a rash yes um so that could be something. So if it, she was pulling something that looked like, um, you know, maybe Queen's Anne's lace and or carrots, that type of thing. So mm-hmm. that's really, uh, that's really interesting. Um, Cause yeah, you don't, I don't hear about wild parsnip as much. No, no, neither do I, neither do I. 
Um, I wonder how many people, it's very interesting that they, the sap has the, the same or the very similar reaction that the giant uh, hogweed does. Um, yeah. But yep. yeah. Um, Edward has also written in, Matt and Joanne, such an important topic tonight. Excellent. Ed. Well, thank you very much, Ed, for, for tuning in. And then we also have Henry who's written in, hi, Matt and Joanne, do you know anything about this? A cruise that Frankie Flowers is giving? And no, we don't, or at least I don't. So we'll have to uh, take a look at that, Henry, for sure. Um, oh, go ahead. No, no. Okay, I just got to yep. route out. Susan has also written in, hi, Matt and Joanne. Speaking of Roundup, is that the best chemical to get rid of all weeds? Kind of, it's the big last big gun, at least here in Canada. Remember, it's a non selective uh, or systemic herbicide. So right. it doesn't care who it touches, and it's yeah. going to go through the entire plant and kill it. And that's why it's so good with the poison oaks and ivies and, and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, it's going to get in and kill that perennial root system and those woody stems that these are going to leave behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, outside of that, I. I mean, with some picking, some cultural control, you know, growing your lawn, you know, making sure you have mulch. Uh, There are some other more organic methods available now in Canada. Not too sure what still 100% is available in the States, Uh, but, you know, everything works differently. So, but just Mm -hmm. again, it's that the cancer killer or the cancer Proven cancer one. So watch That's out. That's right. For that yeah. One. And and like you said, it, it kills anything green it touches. So anything. Like, you know, so I think you're reserving it for those really extreme things like poison like ivy. Poison ivy. Um, but to just, you know, spread it for you know, spray it for dan you know, good old dandelions or crab grass or something like that. Um yeah, not a, not your personal choice, but uh, yes. not not advisable just from the health health standpoint of it, right? Yeah. Is it really worth it? A weed's just a weed, like really. So yeah. So now you say leaves of three. So is there a way? I know it's radio, not video, but is there a way to describe <laughs> poison ivy a little bit, and then we can talk about poison oak? Yeah, yeah. So the leaves of three, leave it be, is that classic kind of saying, right? And yeah. Um, Depending on which poison ivy you have, because there's the uh, eastern and the western. Um, yeah, but uh, they always have that leaves of three and never more. So you'll never ever see, you know, groups of five, six, seven, whatever, or two. They're always leaves of three. They're okay. always alternately held. So if you're not sure, take a look. So what alternately means, alternately held means, is if you look at a stem and you move from the bottom, imagine a trunk. You're going up the trunk or up a stem. You're going to have one on the left and then you're going to have a space and another one's going to come out on the right. And that's how poison ivy works as well. It starts on the left and on the right. Then there's a gap, left, right, gap, left, right. Okay, so that's the alternate leaf. Yep. So that's your alternate leaf. So look for that alternate leaf. You remember it can be new growth in the spring. Uh, It's going to come out red or green or both on the same plant but it's going to be young and very pointed. So you may not see quickly that alternate. So find some woodiness because it is a woody perennial vine uh, and you can look for that a little bit easier. Okay. They're never going to be opposite. They're never going to have thorns. They're never going to have teeth. Like if you imagine you just draw a squiggly, like a bunch of tops of triangles, up, down, up, down, up, down. Like kind of like a wiggly yeah. long, that's serrated again. Yeah, just trying to, yeah, <laughs> radio. Yeah. Um, but they're also never going to have that scalloped edge. So, you know, when you draw the little scallops, when you draw a little round cloud where a kid draws a cloud, they're never going to have round leaves like that. So there are seedlings and other plants that might be around it in the forest floor or out really because they'll go wherever they want. Uh, mm. They're that very versatile. Uh, they will never have those leaves. So no thorns, scallops or serrated edge and always uh, alternate as well mm-hmm. and never any thorns. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you for that. And um, it does say that 50% of people develop signs and symptoms of poison ivy dermatitis. So, you know, symptoms like it is very much like somebody might come in contact and be fine and somebody else um, not so fine. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you might not experience um, the um, initial reaction right away. Yes. Sometimes it can last, it can go from four hours to four days. Um, and then, uh, but sometimes after 
even 21 days after they've never, you know, they've been exposed to the plant. So it, it's certainly something that sticks around, hence the 50 years on the lawnmower. That was a fascinating story. Yeah. So if one other identification tip, if you're not sure and it's closer to the fall, uh, poison ivy is one of the first plants or vines uh, in the landscape to turn fall color. Oh. So you, yeah, so she'll turn uh, before the oaks and a bunch of the other plants, but you'll see uh, red leaves with yellow variegation or yellow centering uh, in between the veins or reverse, like a, a bright yellow with some red marks on in between the veins. Like it's kind of uh, almost losing nutrients. It looks like it needs to be fed, but in the fall. So yeah, another interesting point about it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this does say that poison oak and poison sumac also contain that same compound. That's right. Yeah. I and did not know that. I thought it would as a different poison, but hey, we're let's just put poison in three different plants and you know, <laughs> let, you, let you go. So right? yeah. So where is poison oak? Yeah. So poison oak, um, we're going to again. Uh, oops, sorry, I was looking at something else. Poison oak, we're gonna again see all of these plants are native. Uh, to different parts in North America. So poison oak, we tend to see in the southeastern part of North America. It is a little bit of everywhere. It does reach up upwards towards us as well, but it's more heavily appeared uh, down towards, um, you know, California, uh, or not California, sorry, southern eastern Florida, uh, North Carolina, things like that. And it's often mistaken for poison ivy because you do get some of those oak-like leaves. However, the leaves on them can slightly change as well. So part of the um, poison oak, you, one of the species is um, diverse lobum. So meaning diverse lobes or the lobes change. So on one plant, you can technically see like a very oak leaf appearance, but then also a very poison ivy appearance as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, the poison oak, one that grows out on the, in the Atlantic, uh, tends to be in um, some dry, uh, sandy spots and uh, some, also some of the, the more average soil spots too. But again, leaves of three, again, and just like poison ivy, there's no serrated, scalloped mm -hmm. uh, edges, no thorns. If you picture or Google a Manitoba maple, that's the first one that jumped into my mind. So it's a compound leaf with three leaflets and you have two kind of on the side and then a stem and then a single one. But the outer leaves of the three, the two outer leaves, and if you kind of picture like a hand, a hand, and then one kind of up in the middle, kind of like a three triangles stacked on it, like the Triforce of the Legend of Zelda kind of deal. Uh, the outer edges or shoulders of the margin of that leaf close to the pedial where the leaf is being held kind of has that scalloped uh, edge. So it kind of goes out and in the long out and then in a little bit of a jagged or a toothed edge, and then it goes flat again to a point. So that's one of the ones of the ways for the poison ivy as well. Yeah. But okay. yeah. So then and when we get down there, we can also see a lot of people try to say, you know, they, they just say the same thing. It's poison ivy, but it could be poison oak because their leaves will change and flip. So it can okay. often look very much the same. And yeah. how about um, poison um, sumac? Does it look like sumac? Because sumac, regular sumac, has quite a, an interesting and distinctive leaf. Yeah, yeah. So it does have um, a compound pinnate leaf uh, like okay. the sumacs. It's in the same um, family, the uh, Anacardiaceae family. So it's the sumac and the cashew family. So they have the, the long, uh, pedials that are compoundly pinnate or just sorry pinnate um, with a, anywhere from about seven to 13 little leaflets on them they're nice and dark green they have an entire margin meaning it's completely smooth so there's no weird rough edges or any of the leaves but they do have red stems and little okay. red rachis that so they're the you get the long pedial and then all the leaflets attach and the rachis is that little stem that attaches to the true pedial. So these guys love moist, wet, acidic soils. So they love to be where it's flooded. This is where you're gonna see lots around Florida. 
um, East Central and Eastern United States in a lot of West wet areas. So that edge of the, the river, the pond, the bed. There was a story I was reading something about uh, Sumac this week, and they said long, long time ago, uh, the uh, poison sumac used to consume a lot of the land that Disneyland is currently on. Ah. And they went in and they cleared it all out and changed the swamps. But now you can't really, we're protecting the marshlands like that. And there's laws against yeah. it. But yeah. So this is a very tall, upright, again, native tree uh, reaching anywhere from 15 to 25 feet tall. Oh, so it's like, it is a tree. Mm, like yeah, it's so not you're... a small plant. Yeah. So if you imagine like the normal sumac, you'll get one large, long stem, and then you'll have a cluster of branching, pinnate, long, red stemmed leaves attached to it. And then you get a 10 to 15. You'll usually see it all by itself out where it's, it's wet. You can see it in a fairly um, wet, woody area as well. It will tolerate some partial shade. So it might be in the woods in a wet space as well. And then it'll start to multi-branch somewhat as our, you know, our staghorn sumac uh, or tiger eye sumac eventually will as well. Yeah, so moist acidic areas for sure. Okay. Yeah, brilliant orange red in the fall. So it is beautiful. Um, there are places that are uh, being, are propagating it and using it uh, just as it's a native plant. So they're kind of okay. keeping it and protecting it. There's some value there. Um, but the other thing to note about the, um, poison sumac is it's very valuable for its berries. So the little droops that are white or yellowish uh, that they get are very um, beneficial to things like rabbits and birds and other small animals in the fall when all the other food is gone. Those okay. berries are hanging out and, and they're very valuable to them. Okay, but they're not good for humans. Right, right. We do not okay, want so to. We don't, we don't eat the bright. berries. Okay, so right. the berries are also poisonous. Right, wildlife but, only. <laughs> Wildlife only. That's the disclaimer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> unless you are an animal or look like a squirrel. Well, unless know. you're wild like I am. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And if you're a forger, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, they're a diverse group. Um, there's quite a number. There's, there tend to be some Western poison ivies that are stuck to the West and the West Coast. Um, Western and Central America, but can come to the East Coast. The Eastern poison ivy are regular um, Taxicotodendron. Um, Radicans, that's our classic one, is all over the East. It's the one of all the ivies, oaks, and sumacs that we're physically going to find the most of. It is pretty much everywhere. And the others tend to be a little bit more centralized uh, in places as well. Okay, sorry, say that again. So which one, we're going to find sumac the most? No, we're going to find our normal poison ivy. Oh, okay, sorry. The most, yeah, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when you're reading email and you're talking. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> She's doing her thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, and then the Pacific um, poison oak. So there's the poison oak that grows more on the Pacific. It's more of a big ground vine, climbing vine or shrub that can get up to like 12 feet tall. Um loves that very dry, desolate kind of desert-like location, but it's mm -hmm. almost all stuck in those dry, semi-mountainous regions of California okay. and in spots up the West Coast. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a little bit of poison oak and ivy and sumac for everybody. That's right. <laughs> enough to go around kind of thing. So enough yeah, I mean, around. really, we shouldn't be touching or taking anything out of the forest anyway. So if you're hiking and and camping, you know, it's it's for lots of reasons, the long pants and the socks, pants tucked into the socks, right? And yeah, and things like that. I think gloves is the tricky part. But um, I feel, do you feel bad for people who have gardens that like garden on conservation? Like, you know what I mean? They're so happy yeah. to have a, a yard that backs onto conservation or backs onto, a, you know, wild like a forest and stuff like that. And and it's uh, heartbreaking for me because I'm like, yeah, you know, because then they're also asking for like a low maintenance yard, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but the problem is 
you know, that forest is going to come, come to you. Like, you know what I mean? It's not, it looks yeah. to look at right now. And it looks like it's going to stay on that other side of that chain link <laughs> fence, but it's really not, it's coming to eat you. Like it's coming to take the yard. So you, I can design a low maintenance garden, but you do not have a low maintenance yard because that forest is coming for you. So, um, <laughs> and, and it brings with it sometimes many of those things, you know? So, uh, so yeah. So I always feel bad (laughs) yeah when I have to break their news to them that they really can't have a a low maintenance uh, yard Um, (laughs) so so yeah Uh, very true as we reach the very end we've got some list great listener questions it looks like coming in I'm going to jump in and just uh, hit that little mid-station ID and say thank you everyone for joining us here live on reality radio 101 thank you as well if you've downloaded the podcast and you're listening from comfort of the car or the home or maybe you're on vacation and catching up on some past episodes i'm matthew dressing here with my co-host joanne shaw and you're listening to down the garden path joanne and i enjoy hosting down the garden path each week bringing you interesting and relevant topics to help you achieve a great garden we learn right along with you from our research and from the guests that join us here on the show Uh, don't forget you can spend more time with us down the garden path follow us on instagram and facebook at Down the Garden Path Podcast is our handle there. And like I mentioned, you don't have to be tuning in live to enjoy Down the Garden Path. We've got lots of amazing content spread over all the major podcast providers. So tune in there to search Down the Garden Path Podcast. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button to be notified of new content. And we love hearing from all of our listeners, whether you're live on the radio or you're listening via the podcast, you've downloaded it. Don't forget to like, share, leave us a comment. We love hearing from you. You can always write us here at instudio101 at gmail.com, or you can send it to us directly at down the garden path podcast at hotmail.com. Don't forget to check out our website. You can find Joanne at www.down to the number two earth.ca and naturalaffinity.ca for myself. So our listener questions yeah some, it looks yeah so do you want me to read one for you so you can catch your breath I can yes <laughs> you take away <laughs> uh, uh, let me go um so Jan, like this was one I was just going to bring up so Janice you read my mind uh so she said Joanne and Matt please remember to tell your listeners about this hazard castor bean plant has enough ricin in it to kill a little child even if they just eat three seeds from this plant very toxic to small children. And what shocks me is it's available for sale in most garden centers, right? It is. It, it is. is. Yeah. So it's a plant. Yeah. So it is. Oh, seeds too. So it is a very cool, funky looking ornamental plant. Um, so if you don't, you know, Google it and you will see. So it's castor uh, bean plant. And if once you see the picture, you'll recognize seeing it um, lots of times in like commercial or, you know, in gardens like park gardens, because it's like a big like the backdrop, right? Like a big, interesting leaf looks very, almost very tropical, but shockingly like big, um, big leaves and serrated and very interesting looking It's sometimes a little bit on the burgundy side too, right? Yeah, you get like the pure green form or you can get the burgundy form and sometimes you'll see a green or a burgundy with a little bit of the other color in it. But yeah, beautiful statement piece. Um, Like you said, big tropical broad, like two feet broad palmate leaves, um, big fleshy stems, a little cluster of flowers that quickly turn into uh, little spiked seed pods of beans that are, like you said, exceptionally toxic. Um, yeah, yeah, so we always hear about ricin as like a dangerous, you know, kind of poison in mm-hmm. in war, really, or in bat, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. Or um, uh, so, yeah. So that is kind of shocking that it's still so readily available and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's something to think about. Um, that is a guard, you know, kind of a common garden plant. Uh, I think it's always safe just to make sure the children um, never like take things like no eating berries, no, you know, always show mom, um, you know, nightshade is another, you know, not to jump on you in here. And I think um, we do have some more listener questions, but that's a common one that has like, it's like a weedy vine in the garden. Sometimes they yeah. see it through cedars and it looks fairly innocuous. Often the, there's something that must eat it because I find that leaves are always kind of chewed a bit. But then later in the summer, they have like purple flowers, again, seem fairly innocuous, but later in the summer, they have these little red berries on them. And so I'm always pointing that out to clients, like, you know, it, 
could be a gooseberry. It could be a whatever, right? So it's like, yeah, you should really. Um, so some of it means keeping up with your yard, but also I think the kids need to know humans, parents, family needs to know. We need to do our part to educate everybody um, to not eat them. I agree. I think that's just one of those lost um, arts that I think just as a species as a whole, right? That connection with pl the planet and the, the animals and the plants, you know, this is good. This isn't bad. This means this, this means that. Yeah. There's a lot of communicating they give us that we've kind of lost in our urban lifestyle. Mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and Karen has uh, mentioned, um, we did, we did mention it, Karen, but we will, uh, we will uh, mention it again. Uh, she's saying, don't forget the hogweed plant. So yes, giant hogweed contact with the leaves and sap on this plant can call illness called phytophotodermatitis, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what you were just saying, uh, which is a condition where the skin breaks out in severe blisters if exposed to sunlight and heat, and it can also cause blindness. So, you know, you, if you touch, you have it on your hand and you touch your face or touch your eyes, oh, yeah. um, you know, so it is, it is quite dangerous. Um, I know my son was saying he's in health and safety and he was saying they have, they've had um, they have an outside crew and, and they've had safety meetings about, about it too, so that they workers can be aware of it. So definitely anybody who's working outside um, should know about it as well as hiking and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We have another um, question from Cameron. Cameron's right in, writes in. Hi, Joanne and Matt. Here's a question for you. Why are there poisonous plants to begin with? Was it to protect the plant from animals, humans, medicinal purpose? Why? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, excellent question. Um, and yeah, usually it is, there is a huge predator in the area that is uh, coming through and being eaten or eating the plant en masse. So they develop toxins or colors uh, and things like that to help ward off, um, you know, their natural predators. Um, this grab the skin, they get a rash, whatever. And then, yeah, things start to evolve for sure. Because, I mean, obviously, like we were talking about, the sumac, not good for us to touch it and other animals that might, you know, get it right into their skin level or get into their fur. Uh, but, you know, when they eat the berries, it's a um, great few food source, food resource for those ones, for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, a lot of medicinal purposes. Uh, I think another one that we will have on our list is the aconite. Uh, or Aconitum napellus and those species as well. The whole plant is very poisonous, especially the roots, uh, but it has been long used, especially in Chinese medicine or Asian medicines as things to, you know, uh, relieve pain and aching and arthritis, uh, you know, lower the blood pressure and heart rate for anxiety and other disorders like that. However, it is deadly poisonous. And like the poison ivy, poison oaks, you can take it, you can touch it, um, and it might not react with you right away. So there are a lot of documented stories where people will take it and they, you know, it's not working anymore. So they add a little bit more to their, you know, herbal medicine dose. And suddenly they're in the hospital because, you know, they've yeah. numbed themselves and they wake up and they're barely heart beating. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's lots of different, usually just evolutionary reasons that they yeah. protect themselves and they provide other benefits as we explore them. Mm -hmm. I just want to say <laughs> the common name is monk's hood. Thank, thank you. Right? Yes. And it is also a, a, at the garden center and it's a plant that you could put in your garden and it's very interesting as a very purple flower, pretty purple flower. Yeah, um, yeah. And, but in my lifetime, I think I can remember two people and I think one was a singer uh, that were at a picnic and, you know, I forget who the other one was like, they're not famous, but they were, you know, and a di literally died from monkshood, you know, from, yeah, um, yeah so that is um, it's something to be aware of. The other common name is Wolfsbane. So oh, if you th think okay. back to all of those legends yeah. and stories as kids, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Often used to tip spears and arrows in war. Um, yeah. Making a poultice out of that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this book, um, I have a book here. Uh, it's kind of an old book. So this book deals with, uh, it's called Poisonous Plants. This book deals with over 100 poisonous plants giving fascinating facts about uses past and present. 
um, by F Starry Berger. So I'll put that in the show notes, but mm-hmm. they did, you know, there is a, I didn't want to read the whole book uh, with your question, uh, Cameron, but it did talk about poisons in nature. And it also says, you know, think about um, the animal kingdom also includes poisonous species or rather that, you know, um, or rather species that produce poisonous substances for killing prey or for purposes of defense, like snake venom, um, you know, and poisonous frogs, some salamanders and fish. So it's, it's really in nature, there's quite a bit of, you know, so this is kind of, it's a whole other show. I know (laughs) poisonous animals. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean that this looks like it looks like it is a very interesting book. I'm not sure where I got it, so it was just kind of a coincidence. We'd already decided to do the show, and I was kind of I just did a little glance at my bookshelf <laughs> and to see if I had uh, you know mostly for the picture, me and that uh, poison ivy picture. But uh, and I saw this one, and I'm like, and it's got like those color illustrations, so it's not photos. It's got these illustrations, but it's kind of scary because so many of our plants are, it says it's poisonous, right? Dutchman's breeches. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I, I don't know who's going out eating their garden plants, really don't. <laughs> and it's well, funny. So dandelion is something that's not poisonous and is actually healthy. And that's the thing we keep, we keep trying to kill, you know? So I think that, yeah. that's hilarious. Purslane, <laughs> right? Purslane and, and uh, dandelion and some of the, some of the things that are very beneficial uh, for us. And that plantain. Plantain. Yes. We were talking about plantain and mm-hmm. just to backtrack to stinging nettle. So you were saying, so I have found that I had heard that too. So when I did get some stinging nettle in, I went looking in my yard for um, my lawn for some person, uh, some plantain. Right. And you, did you use it or? I did. I did use it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also susceptible to um, getting stung by things. And so mm-hmm. it's also supposed to help th- with that. So, um, so yeah, I didn't know, I knew to kind of squish it up, but you had said that chewing on it and kind of yeah, so, down the enzymes. Yeah. Like, so I was saying before, um, you know, cats and dogs and other animals, they lick their wounds and there are enzymes in uh, the salivas and, and is ours as well. Cause if you notice how quickly your mouth heals, when you bite it, uh, that heals off, you know, the cuts and whatever. So you can chew it, chew the leaves, make sure it's from a spot that didn't just get treated by pesticide in the lawn, um, but chew it and then spit it out and you can use it as like a little poultice. It's an astringent and it'll pull out toxins and things from your skin. But you can also use it, uh, again, disclaimer, um, don't go eating it all, but uh, you can also use it for digestive tract as well. If you eat too much of it, you can get a little constipated, but yeah. So I uh, usually say we're stings. I've used it on bee stings as well. I've run out, I've been at the garden center, you know, you get a bee sting out to the parking lot. There's some right there, chew it up and just put it on and just kind of leave mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Another plant I wanted to mention too, that I was uh, told by an avid uh, camper and naturalist, a friend of mine, um, spotted touch me not or jewelry. Oh, yes. yeah. In patience capiensis or Cap- is that really to eat it or to not to touch it? No. So yeah. So what it is, it is it tends to grow. The the myth is, and I've noticed it a couple of times, but not always, is that it grows near poison ivy. So oh. usually you can find it. It's got the little orange dangling uh, balsam like yes. flower. But yeah. if you break open the stems, which are hollow and very juicy, being part of the impatient family. Um, or genus, uh, you can rub the sap onto the other oils um, and it binds that arushriol, uh and prevents it from getting entering even more into your skin. Yeah, and it's also another North native North American plant. Yeah, um, so it's kind of evolved, uh, Cameron, side by side, that there's a poison and the cure is usually within arm's reach. Interesting, interesting. Yes, because I know uh, touch me nots because I know my mother in law used to point that out to the kids and like, you know, touch, you know, because when you touch the pot and it pops open. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, so yeah. yeah. A few more questions. Um, do we or do we want to talk about a couple more plants? Uh, we well, jump into our I think we can do a combo because I think our listeners are providing us with some choices here. Yes. Um, so Angel's Trumpet, if people yeah. ingest this plant, again, who's eating it? Um, it usually grows in the wild. It causes hallucinations, paralysis, tachycardia, very high, uncontrollable heart rate, memory loss and death. Stay away. But it's beautiful. Um, so I don't know that that grows here in our climate, Lenora. So thank you for your question. Do you see that picture, Matt? Does it grow? 
Yeah, it doesn't like winter here, but okay. I know that the city of Oshawa um, often uses it as a very large flowering tree because like Lenora's picture, if you guys want to Google angels trumpet, uh, it is absolutely stunning with these big, long, like eight to 12 inches long yellow trumpets, orange, white, a uh, number of colors, variegated foliage. They're yeah, kind of hanging down like they're kind Looking of very straight like, down. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But you, you are correct, Lenore. Yeah, it is uh, the seeds, the, the leaves, the flowers. Uh, it all has all of those properties. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oshawa uses it like every single year. There's I can really in like 15 plants right now. I think Oshawa also <laughs> uses the, the castor bean plant too. I think I'm it pretty does. sure. It does. Yeah, it does. And Parkwood does as well because it's one of those heritage annuals that they would grow around it oh, okay okay yeah. well that brings us to um sean's question is like why would God- garden centers still sell plants that can kill small kids <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think well the, the the seed the seed is the poison right so i think when they're selling it it's not gonna kill you but when you take it home <laughs> so i think that i don't know i'm just being funny but anyway <laughs> yes yeah no you know what there are lots of kids um plants that are out there even just you know the monkshood is still again many beautiful flowering cultivars um still seen in garden centers but again you can touch it you can eat it uh and it'll kill you but it, i think it, like you were saying it kind of comes down to just you know educating our kids and ourselves and hopefully mm-hmm. we're getting that and hopefully you're not just randomly running around after the age of four Tasting things, putting yeah. stuff in your mouth yes mm-hmm. so yeah yeah although I, i've seen that sometimes in gardens like on the some of the facebook groups with garden like somebody will show a picture I, I think it was golden chain tree or something and somebody showed a picture and it's a cool funky tree that you don't see very often and somebody said oh I, i've always wanted one of those for my garden and everybody somebody wrote in and said you can't get that they're poisonous and i'm thinking like what <laughs> like everything's poisonous <laughs> like she's she wants it for her garden she's not going to eat it like i don't know i just kind of think you know you can go for extremities both ways right so, oh totally for sure yeah, yeah for sure so yeah um and uh, so that i think got uh did that do that yeah that was sean's and then next we had brad uh brad said hello joe and maddie wrote you a week ago or sorry brad i I don't think we wrote you back. So we, I, we uh, yes, I apologize, Brad. I did get that message. Oh, so Brad also just said, here's a plant that a lot of people who do not think about, uh, but can be very bad for you. Water hemlock uh, plant or shrub that's often thought to be wild carrot or parsley, but considered most violently toxic plant in North America. It can cause entire host of health problems for people, some of which are very severe. So thank you. Yes. And um, just, uh, just as you were saying that, I just quickly looked at it and yeah, it is, very much like that umbel flower, very parsley, um, wild carrot kind of looking for sure. So thank you very much, Brad, for that. And again, um, apologies for not getting back to you sooner. Yes. As we reach the last five minutes or so of the show, Mike has also written in hi to my favorite gardening show. I love writing into you. We love that you write us, Mike. Uh, Mike has written in the plant white snake root has a toxic chemical called uh, tremetol. The plant is sometimes eaten by dairy cattle while grazing and the chemical gets in the milk of the cow. Abraham Lincoln's mom died this way after ingesting some tainted milk. Ooh, and unfortunately, Mike, your your plant, uh, your picture didn't make it through, but we'll uh, take a look at it. So there's another one for you guys, white snake root, um, Agarantina altissima, so known as the white snake root. Yeah, perfect. So thank you very much for writing in that as well so i think i mean we had a a, we had a good list ourselves but i think a a lot of people thank you so much everybody who has written in and uh let us know all of those plants that you guys uh are running into the ornamental plants you had good questions about their evolution why we're selling them and uh brought up a few that i don't think we did have on our list because you know how we can be with trying to talk about lots of exciting or interesting that's right plants. So thank that's you right. very much everybody for writing in yeah I mean I always I think um I know with small kids I've always um you know my thing when my boys were little was for them to like I'd say look look with your eyes and look with your like look, you know keep your nose you know just not with your hands you know that kind of thing I was like mm. look with your eyes and your nose and like you know meaning that just put your face although you don't want to get t- you know anything that's going to st- rub on your face but 
um, you know, versus their hands kind of thing. So things that had, um, you know, potential danger anywhere. I was always like, you know, look first and, and um, don't touch it, you know, that type of thing. So, um, so yeah, so that's all we can do. And it's, it's, um, you know, I think, I think especially uh, we want people out in nature and people want to be out in nature yes. and camping and enjoying the space. So um, always, you know, pick up a guidebook or, or pick up a, a few uh, post uh, print out some things from the internet before doing that um, so that you have a, an idea of what you're looking for um, when you're there. And things cool like uh, Google Lens. I, I did a mm-hmm. garden tour on Saturday and it was the first time. So we obviously did our first garden tour with the Pickering Garden Club that we've done in three years and lots of change. So it was very interesting to see a lot of the ladies had the apps and that they could ID. So even Google Lens, and I know I've been hiking with my husband and we found like a really interesting quirky colored mushroom and he used Google Lens to ID it. Uh, So yeah, so if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you obviously don't have a, you know I mean? You can't, uh, um, you know, look it up, but uh, sometimes if you Google Lens is a good app, handy app to have to ID anything. So whether it's leaves, it could even be a tree leaves that you're wondering what kind of tree this is or something like that, but things like poison ivy or mushrooms and, and stuff like that. So, uh, so yeah, so on that note, that's just something, you know, that you can, or you can even take, if you have no signal or whatever, you can take a picture of it and then ID it later when you get a signal. So, so that's another great use um, yeah. for doing that. So, yeah. So have you, have you done anything with Google Lens? Well, it was funny because it just reminded me, I was, I maybe have told this story before, so I'll make it quick, but I was designed something for a friend and then we ended up, uh, my friend and my design client at the same uh, little gathering and they had an app and they took a picture on the phone of a hydrangea and we're like, Matt, look, we didn't even need to hire you for the design. Look, my phone does it now. Well, I looked at the phone to read it and the phone gave them the wrong hydrangea. Ah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, maybe you do. Um, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I have. And yeah, for sure. And I was just thinking too, as you go to like, you know, state parks or provincial parks, take a look at their gatehouse or their entry points. They do usually have a lot of uh, literature on some of the common plants or toxic plants or uh, things that you're going to see within the park just in case. So yeah, that's a good uh, yeah. tip too. Excellent. And then just to like to what your boys say, you know, when in doubt, don't. Um, yeah. So I want to just reiterate again, just for those who have shown up a little late, just before we say goodbye and thank you one more time, remember that if you've listened to this show, uh, you know, we're just introducing you and talking to you about some of the plants that are out there that can be harmful. Any treatment methods, remember, we are not giving you medical advice. It's just stuff based on me, Joanne, and some of our listeners. If you encounter any of these plants, please seek medical attention immediately. And in case of an emergency, always call 911, mm-hmm. right? When in doubt, don't. So happy adventuring out into the wilderness. We hope you all reconnect with uh, nature. I was at two provincial parks this weekend. Ooh. Uh, so I'm out there. So maybe I'll see you on the trail. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. We want to thank everybody for listening. We would love for you to support us and buy our book um, available at Down the Garden Path, uh, a step-by-step guide to your Ontario garden, although it expands beyond Ontario. So listeners, there's lots of great info there and it's available at amazon.ca and amazon.com. That's right. We'll hope to see you next week here on Down the Garden Path live on Reality Radio 101. Until then, take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101.